Hello and welcome to the final week of The Loft's virtual wordplay. My name is Caitlin Bolin and I am the Individual Giving Director at The Loft. We're so glad you're here. We hope that during the challenges of COVID-19 that this little corner has been a place of respite and creative inspiration for you. As you may know, when we began planning wordplay, our intention was to have 100 authors and 10,000 visitors celebrating books in downtown East Minneapolis. Well, with a quick and thoughtful pivot, we have loved the opportunity to engage with you at home, bringing you conversations with today's top authors on conversation topics across the spectrum. Because you have shown up for us, we've reached over 40,000 viewers across the country. We are so grateful to provide all of our wordplay sessions to you free of charge, and that is due in large part thanks to the forward-thinking generosity and leadership of our sponsors, and especially our founding partners, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune. We would not be here without them. And while their support has gotten us this far, we turn to you, our dear virtual audience members, to bring us to the finish line. This week, as Minnesota raises funds as part of hashtag Give at Home MN, and as we celebrate hashtag Giving Tuesday now across the US, we ask you to please consider including the loft in your giving plans. Your gift of any size allows readers and writers to continue to receive support through classes, fellowships, events, challenging conversations, and more, all at the loft. And your donation will automatically make you one of our fantastic members. We hope you will support us as we support the literary community. Thank you for all you do for The Loft and enjoy wordplay. Hi everyone, thank you for coming to The Loft's Wordplay. I'm Steph Opitz, the founding director of Wordplay, and I'm so thrilled you're here. In our last few days of Wordplay, I wanted to do a few thank yous um, to our presenting sponsors, St. Catherine University and the Star Tribune, um, and then to some behind the scenes colleagues, some of whom you've seen on camera and sometimes you have not, Abby Frank Taylor, Chris Jones, Rachel Yang, who have been on every session leading us through this virtual train. And also to our amazing intern team, Alex Davison, Claire Jessel, Lucy Beer Shank, Abby Sliva, and Christine Stevens. It's taken a remarkable amount of work to shift this entire festival to virtual, and we couldn't have done it without them. We also couldn't have done it without our audience. Hi to everyone. Thank you for being here. And of course, our amazing authors. Um, I'd love today to introduce Jana Shortle, our hero local host of the Breaking News at CARE 11, and the one and only Scott Pelly. They will be discussing Scott's memoir, Truth Worth Telling, as a part of St. Catherine's Critical Conversation Series. I encourage you to click on the link below and get yourself a copy of Scott's book if you haven't yet. Um, while you're there, if you would like to throw an extra dollar or two to the loft, we'd greatly appreciate it. All this programming is, of course, free, and we're happy to provide it, but we'd love to keep doing so. Um, and if you have questions for Scott and Jana, um, there is a questions button somewhere over here um, where you can add any question you might have, and we will do that at the end of the session. So Jana, Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Steph, and thanks to everybody watching from home or from work, if you're still working, we appreciate y'all being here. It is definitely an honor of mine to be able to speak with Scott Pelly through Zoom, through any way I can possibly do. 
it's Scott, you're a journalist I've looked up to my entire career. So I appreciate this time. Uh, and let's let's talk about the book, Truth Worth Telling. You know, I, I admittedly just read it in the last week. It's a good time to actually devour an entire book. And what struck me, obviously, is what's in the pages, but the title of it and so many themes that come across that seem applicable to right now, even though the book came out a year ago. Well, Jana, we uh, were talking with our publisher at HarperCollins uh, a, a year and a half ago, and we were kicking around ideas for the name. And finally, truth worth telling seemed to be a, a unifying theme for the entire book because it is a journalist's journey through this world, which is so often confusing and so often duplicitous and so often hard to figure out. And it's really the story of how journalists do figure out these great events of our times. You use the word unifying and coming up with the title. I like that. Um, that was that was intentional. That we live in a time that hardly anyone to describe as unified. Well, that's that's true, and uh, it seems to have become more and more that way. Even even during this pandemic, you know, I I remember as you do, um, the day after nine eleven, you know, September twelfth, two thousand one. This country had never been so united. Uh, we had been attacked by an outside force and everyone was in it together. And, you know, I have found in recent days in the last few weeks that the political discourse on the left and the right has not made me feel like we're all in this together. Um, even though we have been attacked by this time an unseen force, um, it seems to have in this moment caused more derision in this country than, uh, than it has created a, a unifying effect. And I, I, think that's, I think that's too bad. I, I, one of the themes in the book is that we have to, in order to have a successful democracy, we have to talk to one another. We can't wall ourselves off in digital citadels of confirming information where the only thing we hear is that what we already believe is right. You know, no democracy has ever thrived that way. And I worry a great deal about our country when Americans who have so much in common, so much to be thankful for, essentially stop talking to one another and stop listening. Interesting. Well, maybe that's where we can start in terms of, you know, you say right out of the gate with your book, you, you basically come up with this beautiful question that to me is both a question and a thesis statement for the entire thing. I think you might know what I'm talking about, which question it is. Would you tell our audience what that is and what it means? Uh, the <clears throat> question we pose in the, the introduction to the book is it's more of a statement, but, but it raises a question in the mind, and that is, don't ask the meaning of life. Life is asking, what's the meaning of you? And that occurred to me when I was anchoring the CBS Evening News and we were in Paris after the terrorist shootings there had killed so many people, and I had seen men, women, children, laying flowers at a makeshift memorial on a street in Paris. And I was looking in their faces and seeing the kind of bewilderment that I had seen before in places like Oklahoma City and downtown in New York on 9-11, the look of people who were thinking, what is life about if life can be taken so capriciously in this world. And it occurred to me that maybe we were asking the wrong question, not, not to ask the meaning of life, but to ask what is the meaning of you? In other words, in these enormous historic moments of our time, such as the one we're living through today, what are you going to bring to that moment? What parts of your character are going to show through in that moment, what is the meaning of you? 
And that's what a lot of the chapters in the book are about, Jana. For example, the first chapter is called Gallantry. And it's about the men and women of the fire department of the city of New York that I witnessed going into the World Trade Center towers on 9-11. And the book is very much about the individual choices people make in the great and momentous moments of our time. That beginning with 9-11 is so powerful. For all of you listening to this conversation and watching at home, I cannot stress enough that first gallantry chapter is something as a person and, and as a journalist who was working during 9-11, it absolutely took me back to a time and a place with such vivid memories and I learned so much from it. So I wanna thank you for that chapter and for sharing your experience because honestly, Scott, it sounded traumatic for you, what happened to you that day, what your experience was to get down to World Trade Center. Well, uh, Janet, certainly was, and as it was for many people, of course, on that day. As a, as a journalist, I was in midtown Manhattan when the airplanes hit, and so I ran straight down to the World Trade Center to cover the story. And as soon as I got there, I noticed that the tower, the, the television antenna on tower number one looked to me like it was ticking back and forth like a metronome. I was right down on West Street, right below the building. And as I watched the tower tick back and forth, the mast on top of tower number one, I, I thought, well, that can't be. That must just be the heat torturing the light. But as soon as I thought that, saw that and thought that, the building began to fall. And you may have heard people describe seeing cataclysmic events as if they happened in slow motion. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's exactly what happened because in my mind's eye, I saw the building collapse one floor and then stop and then the next one and stop and the next one and stop. And I thought in that moment, maybe it won't fall all the way to the ground. Maybe it's just going to stop right there. But of course, what you and everyone else saw on television was the building just racing uh, to the ground. I don't know how I got there, but the next thing I remember is being on my knees in West Street with the building collapsing, and I'm calling out to God out loud, and I said, Lord, take them all with no pain. I had known from previous reporting that at any given time, there would be 25,000 people in each of the buildings. I don't remember getting up. The next thing I remember is I'm running faster than I'd ever run before with the sound of steel crashing into the street behind me. I don't know how far I ran, but after a certain period of time, I realized that the conflagration behind me was beginning to die down. So I turned around and went back to ground zero, and I spent two weeks there uh, covering the story for CBS. CBS News was on the air for 96 hours straight, no commercials, no breaks, all day, all night, 96 hours. Um, and I believe that that was CBS's finest hour. It's so important, as you know, Jenna, to provide accurate, generally reliable information in a crisis. It's the lifeblood of a democracy. in a crisis. Strange thing to say, but I was honored to be there. I was honored to be able to help in my way in that moment and in that time. I completely, completely understand that. Um, you say in your book, journalism is a quest to open minds, not to close them. Well, that's something that a friend of mine used to say, uh, Fred Friendly, who was one of the great producers. He was Ed Murrow's producer at at sixty at, at uh, CBS, and uh, later became the president of CBS News. And I knew Fred late in his life. Uh, but Fred's point was that journalism is not a popularity contest. In fact, if you do it right, you're probably going to anger a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> 
but uh, it, it, it is an effort to open minds, not close them. And I think that's so important in this day and age when we have, uh, for example, websites and cable channels, both on the left and the right, that are trying to make a point, that are trying to close people's minds on a subject. Instead of providing a variety of opinion, as we do in the mainstream media, to let the American people decide for themselves, to consider all the arguments, to hear things they don't want to hear because they don't agree with them, and then make a decision about how they feel. That's, that's how democracies work. Uh, it is the only way democracies work. I mean, think of our wonderful country, Jenna. Uh, coast to coast, border to border, made up almost entirely by people who are from somewhere else, people who practice every religion on the planet, speak nearly every language on the planet. How do you get those 330 million people to move not left, not right, but forward? Well, the only way you can do that is to listen to that big conversation, to compromise, to not get everything you want, but get most of what you need and move the country forward. And I fear that that has been lost on Capitol Hill and in Washington. And I look forward to a day, maybe after this pandemic, that we can get back to that national conversation. Me too. One of the, I think what I noticed most about this book, and Steph alluded to it in her introduction of you, it is a memoir of a reporter's life that spans decades and takes us all over the world. But what's interesting about your memoir, Scott, is that while it's about you, it's not really about you. It's a history book where you take me to these significant events and a story emerges from a person who actually lived it. You're just there to narrate it for me. That's that's right. It, it, it is a, sort of a strange kind of memoir, I guess, because it is about the stories that I've covered in my life. But uh, as I sat down to write this book, I thought to myself, no one is going to care about a memoir about me. If, if this book started with, I was born in Lubbock, Texas in 1957, and then there were another 500 pages no one would care about that. But it did occur to me, Jenna, that I had met, I had the great privilege of meeting the most fascinating people in the world during real crises in their lives. For example, there's a, another chapter called Selflessness. It's about an Air Force nurse, Paulette Shank, that I met at the Air Force Theater Hospital in Balad in Iraq. And in that chapter, you learn a great deal about the war in Iraq, but the chapter is about Paulette and the sacrifices she made to save the lives of gravely wounded American soldiers and Marines. So that is an interesting person. The men and women of the FDNY, those are interesting people. The people who lived the history and, again, who made decisions about what part of their character would show through when the difficult time came along. You also go into, you talk, yes, about paramedics, firefighters on 9-11, a, a young woman, I believe, in, in Iraq uh, that wound up to win the Nobel. Am I right? Was that Iraq? Yes, uh, it, it was Iraq. Uh, that, is, that is a chapter that got written after the book was written. Uh, I, I was, um, we had put the book to bed. It was going, it was going off to the printer. And uh, I got news one day. I was sitting in a hotel room in Washington getting ready for an interview. The phone rang. I picked it up and I got news that made me call my publisher and say, stop the presses. I have got one more chapter we've got to write. And it, it's a story about a young woman who, um, we met in northern Iraq at a time when we at 60 Minutes were doing a story about the atrocities that were being committed by ISIS, which had taken over northern Iraq. 
One of the things that they had tried to do is commit genocide against a community called the Yazidis. Uh, the Yazidis, about 500,000 people, practice an ancient religion that far predates Islam. And so when ISIS came through there, they considered the Yazidis to be non-believers. They gathered up all the military-aged men and shot them and put them in mass graves that they dug with bulldozers. They took the women and they sold them, sold them into slavery, sexual slavery. And this young woman was 21 years old. We found her in a refugee camp. One of my associate producers, Rachel Morehouse, found her in a refugee camp and asked her to tell her story on 60 Minutes. Well, you can imagine she didn't want to. Um, she, uh, the rape was something that uh, had a, a great stigma in her very conservative society. She didn't want her own family to know what had happened to her, much less the rest of the world. But she decided for whatever reason, she would come meet me and we would talk about doing the interview. She came into the room and I, she was shaking. And the first thing I said to her was, let's not do this. I can see that you're concerned. Um, we think the world needs to hear this story, but look, let's not do this. And she gathered up some strength from a place that I don't know that she was even aware of and said, no, I'm going to do it. But there were going to be some conditions. One, she was going to wear a veil over her face. Two, she wanted all the men in my camera team to stand behind curtains so she couldn't see them during the interview. And then she asked my associate producer, Rachel Morehouse, to sit next to her and hold her hand. Well, of course, we did all of those things. She told this harrowing story of being sold and raped and sold and raped and sold and raped again before she was able to escape and make it to this refugee camp. It occurred to me in the beginning of the interview, Jana, she was very frightened and very hesitant. But as the interview went on, she gathered this strength in telling her story. And it seemed to me that at the beginning she was speaking for herself, but by the end she realized she was speaking for her people. We took her back to the refugee camp, never expected to see or hear from her again. And um, she was resettled by the Germans uh, into Germany and joined a uh, Yazidi human rights organization. The United Nations heard of her and asked her to come speak to a meeting in Geneva. That went well. She did some other things for the United Nations. Her profile began to rise. And I'm sitting in this hotel room five years later in Washington. The phone rings, and that's when I learned that Nadia Murad had won the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, that's a pretty good day's work to go into a refugee camp, find a young woman, and just set her on this path that led her to win the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Committee awarded her the prize because of the work that she had done to illuminate the crimes suffered by women in war. And so that's that my next call was to my publisher. I said, I have got to write this in the book. I'll, I'll have a chapter for you in a couple of days. And the people at HarperCollins were kind enough to let me do that. Pretty impressive for a journalist to move the goalposts, otherwise known as a deadline, but I'm glad you were able to. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely, the story was too good. It was too good, and, and I'm so grateful it was in there because it was just yet another that is inspiring in this book. And not all are, you know, there's, there's some troubling things in there too. And folks, again, if you're watching, there's a blue button, I'm told at the screen, where you can buy Scott's book and check these out for yourself. It's well, well worth your time. But you just told a story about giving someone voice, which is in essence what we do. And so that while the, the book isn't really about you, there are parts about you in it. And I think folks will wanna know how did and why did Scott Pelley become a journalist? 
Well, that's buried in the middle of the book somewhere. Um, I, it finally occurred to me while I was hammering away on this desk that's across the room from me. I thought, well, I'm going to have to say something about myself. So there's a little biographical uh, uh, chapter in the middle. I grew up in West Texas um, uh, in fairly, fairly modest means, but um, I was fascinated by my high school journalism teacher. I wanted to be a photographer, a still photographer. My uncle had given me a camera and I thought it was the most magical thing in the world. So I joined the journalism class in my high school. Marjorie Wilson, my high school journalism teacher, was one of those teachers that I think we've all had that just set me on fire. If she had taught math, I would be an accountant today. But she taught journalism, and she made journalism the most fascinating thing in the world. And I found out that the local newspaper, the Lubbock Avalanche Journal, which at the time was a 90,000 daily, uh, hired high school kids to work the midnight, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the three to midnight shift uh, as, as cop, what, what was known in a, in a gender insensitive way as copy boys. Mm -hmm. Girls, but somehow they all called us copy boys. So anyway, I went to the AJ to uh, the Avalanche Journal to apply for a job and I had a temporal problem. They only hired kids who were 16 and I was 15. So I did what anyone would do. I lied about my age. My career in search of the truth began with a lie. Mm -hmm. Well, they hired me. I went to work and uh, fell in love with the place. Great big city room full of clattering typewriters and telephones. It was hot type in those days. These were, these were linotypes with boiling uh, lead in them and, and little old men running these enormous keyboards and these linotype machines to set the type for the paper. It was just romantic as hell. And I loved everything about it. It was the most exciting thing I had ever seen. And after a, a couple of years, I became a reporter there. And my stories were on the front page of the Lubbock Avalanche Journal, being disseminated as far away as Muleshoe, Texas. And I was really enthralled with that. And one thing led to another. I got interested in television. Uh, worked at a television station in Lubbock, then another one in Dallas, and then another one in Dallas. Uh, I worked at an NBC station like you do, Jana. And, um, and then CBS hired me 32 years ago, and I've been at 60 Minutes for 22 years. I think it's fair to say from what I read in that chapter that you were rather persistent, however, to get many of those jobs. Absolutely very persistent. No one ever wanted to hire me. I have never been, seriously, I have never been invited for an interview. Um, it took four years uh, for me to get a job working at it all the time at CBS. Um, they, CBS invited me up to, to speak with them because they'd seen the work I had done in Dallas. I did all these meetings at CBS. I thought it went really well. I went home. They never called me back. The next year, I asked them, hey, can I come back up and see you again? Sure thing. Have all the meetings again. It all goes really well. I go home. They never call me back. Third year, one of my friends at CBS called me and said, hey, they're hiring three new correspondents. Now's your chance. I said, great. So I called the director of recruiting at CBS, and this is a direct quote, Jana. He said, Scott, we know your work, and there's no need for you to apply. That's exactly what I said. And so the next thing I said was, have you filled the jobs? And he said, no, I haven't. Why? And I said, because I'm coming to see you. I'll do it on my own dime. I'm just asking for 10 minutes of your time. I flew from Dallas to New York. He saw me for maybe half an hour. I went home and in the Tom Hanks Hollywood version of, the, of this movie, I get the job. Didn't happen then either. It took another year before CBS finally caved in and hired me. But I tell this long, boring story for this reason. If there are any young journalism students out there, particularly those of you who are graduating this spring, don't take no for an answer. 
You're going to be told no again and again and again. You're going to get, Jana can tell you this. You can, you're going to collect no's 30 to 1. But the only people who don't work in our business are the people who give up. And the people who never give up make really great reporters. You mentioned uh, in the book that you're always, there is a, a chapter, I believe, or when you talk about becoming the evening host of the CBS Evening News, you talk about gratitude and being grateful. And you say that, I believe no one is self-made. We are fashioned from the generosity of others. And that you remained grateful and gracious as, as you ascended to one of the biggest jobs in television news. You know, the, the thing about gen, uh, television, Jenna, and you know this as well as anyone, is that uh, we get way too much credit for the work of others, right? For every story that I do, every story that you do, there's a camera person, often a sound engineer, there are producers, uh, executive producers, there are video editors, and all of these things. And, and, and we get to be, you and I, we get to be the face of that team. But as you do, I never forget that all of those people have worked endless hours and often taken extreme risks to tell the story, to give voice to the voiceless, and incidentally, to make me look good. So when I became the anchorman of the CBS Evening News and the managing editor there, I had now suddenly, for the first time in my life, this worldwide staff of people who were doing all of this work for the broadcast, risking their lives every day in many cases to bring the truth to the broadcast. So I started signing all of my emails, not thanks or Scott or whatever. I signed all of my emails to all of these people grateful because I wanted them to know how much I cared about the work that they did amazing. I have two more questions. One is in your book, you say to the reader who's just picking it up for the first time, you say, if you are anxious and confused, I wrote this for you. What Can that you mean? believe that? Can you believe that that got published a year ago? Uh, and and the, the reason I wrote it a year ago is because Terrorism was very much fresh in our minds with ISIS attacks all around the world, including in California, with these mass shootings that we all find so perplexing, so bewildering, and with this complete breakdown of political discourse in Washington. I thought a little over a year ago when I was writing that line, I thought, uh, you know, I think people are, are anxious and worried and they would like to have some stories about people who met those kinds of difficult times and triumphed over them. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I meant at that time. But of course, who could have imagined the way those words would resonate, you know, this very day? When I got the book last week, I opened it when I was in the newsroom uh, because I rushed to get it and, and my fiance brought it to me. And so I had it available to me in the newsroom. And I read that line and I put it back down because mm -hmm. I knew I'd have to be somewhere where I could have time. Um, because for me, even as a journalist, to be honest with you right now, Scott, I am anxious and confused. And so I knew I would come back to this book because I, I was your audience at that point. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and if any of you listening um, want to pick up the book, there's a button on the screen, but that comes right at you right in the very beginning. And I don't know if there were ever a better time to pick up that book, which leaves me with my last question for you. Scott Pelly. If life is asking, what is the meaning of you? What is your answer? Oh boy. Oh. I would sincerely hope that my wife and my son and my daughter would say the meaning of me was to be a good dad and a good husband. I, that's a trite answer, but what could be more fundamental to a human being than to be a good, a good husband, a good wife, a good father to, to your children? And I mean that 
very sincerely, especially since my 27 year old son has been living with me the last eight weeks <laughs> here in Connecticut instead of the, at his place in Manhattan. Um, but the professional answer to that question, Jenna, is the meaning of me is to, is to seek the truth uh, in sort of the way of the scientific method to not care where the truth takes me, as long as it's the truth, and to report that to our audience and to all the people who read the book and, and watch 60 Minutes and CBS News. Um, you know, James Madison um, wrote in 1800 that freedom of the press is the right that guarantees all the others. Madison knew when he wrote the Bill of Rights, that if we could say what we wanted to say, read what we wanted to read, write what we wanted to write, then all the rights in the Bill of Rights would be protected. And to me, that is the, the very essence of what I have tried to do in my life. Well, I'm grateful that you have chosen this path and that you were so persistent and that you continue to be for the betterment of, of we the people. So I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful to read this book. Uh, Steph, I'm sure the audience has questions for Scott Pelley uh, that even I, of course, could not think of. So if you want to take over and, and let those rip, um, I'm oh, eager wow. to listen to the answers. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. That was um, wonderful. And it's um, fun to see a journalist be interviewed. <laughs> Uh, microphone changes hands. Um, but thank you for those thoughtful answers, Scott and Jana, for those wonderful questions. Um, we've got a lot of audience questions coming in, so I'm going to just get started. Um, the first one comes from Abby, um, and this is for both of you. You both deal with such heavy content every day. How do you take care of yourselves in a way that allows you to stay open and avail available for these stories? That is an incredibly uh, uh, insightful perceptive question. You know, I, I often tell journalism students, a police officer or a firefighter might go to one of these life-changing cataclysmic events, maybe once in their career, but reporters go to all of them. We travel all around the world and we go to every single one of them, one after another, 9-11, Oklahoma City, Hurricane Katrina, the pandemic, anything you care to mention. And it really does get under your skin. I did not believe that until I realized that I was suffering, or I should say I was told that I was suffering from PTSD after my experience on 9-11. Uh, now that was impossible, of course. Uh, I am a reporter, I am a professional, and I'm a man. So I couldn't possibly have been affected by that building falling in front of me and seeing all of those people killed. Well, after a year or two of anxiety and depression, it was finally explained to me and I understood it and I embraced that. And now I tell young journalists that they have to watch for that. They're not too tough for that. They're not too professional for that. They are human beings. These things do get under your skin. They do get in your head. Having a wonderful family at home makes it so much easier, but you also have to take care of yourself for your family. I would echo much of what Scott said. I've been in journalism now a little over 20 years. And just in that time, and Scott may agree, uh, in, as my career has progressed, we were taught to be tough and to never speak of it because we are just narrators. We can possibly feel anything or have opinions about anything or react to anything. That is not our job. I understand why it was taught that way, but that's just not the human condition. And to sit with people in some of their toughest moments and for that not to get into your bones, I fundamentally disagree that that's the way journalism should be. If you don't feel something, 
then I don't know that you'll be able to retell that story or produce a good story. I don't, and at first, I don't see that as, or I don't anymore, I no longer see that as a negative in this business that we have to endure, right? We are privileged to be at the seat of history as these people trust us to retell their stories so you can get it. And yes, on the flip side of that, we must take care of ourselves in any way you can think of. of I, I'm no different than anyone else. I watch goofy TV shows with my fiance. I read a tremendous amount. I love music. I have really started because there's no noise pollution anymore, sitting out in my driveway and listening to the birds and the dawn chorus between four and seven. So I think that these are all healthy things. But one thing I have seen change in the industry is that we are encouraged to take care of ourselves now, at least in the newsroom I work for. And previously, 20 years ago, we just didn't talk about that. But we are in a place in America where mental health is being talked about more and more. It's crucial, especially Scott knows he's in New York, his son's in New York. What's happened with the New York City Police Department in the last two years is we've got it. People in stressful jobs just need to at least have some sort of outlet. And so I am grateful for the stories that people share. Um, and I know I need to give myself some space to, to let those out of myself as well. Um, this is a question from uh, one of the social media broadcasts. Uh, not to get overly political, but when much of the media is consistently labeled as fake, how do we begin to return to a point where we as a country can trust reporting of basic facts? You know, I had a guy walk, <coughs> guy walk up to me on the street in Manhattan, obviously more than nine weeks ago. And uh, he, he came up to me and said, oh, this must be a terrible time to be a reporter. And I said, no, this is a great time to be a reporter because politics has focused the American people's attention to some degree on us. And so it's an opportunity to show the American people what we do, why we do it, and most importantly, to describe to the American people what our values are. And so I see this as a time when we can be reintroduced to the American people. Um, you're not going to get through to everybody. You're not going to get to open every closed mind. But this can be one of the best times to be in journalism. I tell young people, uh, particularly uh, students in, in journalism uh, class, that this is an age for us to be able to do our jobs in the way that Madison envisioned them, to tell stories without fear or favor. And by that, simply by doing our jobs, show the American people our value. Also, Jana, do you have anything to add to that? Yep, I completely agree. I think that you can get lost, and I think this happened in the beginning of fake news accusations, that you want to defend yourself, right? That's the human condition. The survivalist in us wants to say, don't do that, and, and here's how I'm good. I think if you cut that out and focus on what Madison said and what Scott just reiterated, if you cut that out and you know in your heart and in your mind that you are telling the truth and that you are doing this for the public good, you're only trying to be of service, which was why the press was founded, to be a watchdog, to tell the truth, to give all of you the information and let you decide. If you just keep it simple and that very framework, it's not hard at all and it's actually quite beautiful. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do it. As Scott said, I'm not going to convince every person walking down the street that I'm not what they've already assigned me to be. All I can do is my work and let my work speak for itself, not get into a shouting match on the internet. Um, this question is from Sheila. As a former journalist myself, what can ordinary citizens do to encourage public compassion? Just read Camus' The Plague for the first time. How often we show compassion during a plague pandemic, then revert to divisive actions, the media too, Feel free to summarize. <laughs> I think that feel free to summarize was maybe to me, but I was just reading the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
how, how can we create compassion? Well, you, you create compassion in your own home and you create compassion in your own person. And you try to shine that compassion out through your community, I think. Um, do nice things. Say nice things. Do good works. It's contagious. I, it's, it's probably the wrong word to use in this context, but, but compassion is contagious. Uh, it can move from one person to another. Uh, do a good deed. Uh, and, uh, and when you speak, speak without rancor and make an effort not to speak. And by that, I mean, make an effort to listen, make an effort to listen and understand what the other person is trying to tell you. I, I long for the day that we get back to that national conversation. Uh, America has always, always been a shouting match, of course, because of the amazing diversity of people that we were talking about earlier. But there was a time when we were much better listeners um, and didn't vilify one another. I remember when on Capitol Hill, among legislators, the other guy had a bad idea. Today, the other guy is a bad guy, and you can't compromise with someone that you have vilified in that way. We have to come back to rationality and not demonize each other, but debate the issues and give each other the benefit of the doubt. That's how democracies work well, and that's how compassion thrives in a society. Jana, do you have anything you want to add to that? The only thing I will add was something my rabbi told me. Uh -huh. It is just that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, this next question for Scott, can you and Tom broke out, make a podcast where fans can hear you both talk and we listen to your voices and experiences? <laughs> I, I am the biggest fan. Tom is my hero. And I'll tell you why he's my hero. I know him well, but I don't know him from journalism. I know him from charity. Uh, Tom and I were both on the board of a organization in New York called the International Rescue Committee, which uh, was founded at the suggestion of Albert Einstein immediately after the Second World War to take care of the world's refugees, uh, to, to feed the starving in refugee camps, to provide medical care. And when conflicts in the world became intractable to help resettle those refugees into non-conflict areas. And um, that's where I got to know Tom Brokaw was there uh, doing that kind of charity work. Um, Tom and I have never worked together. He's of course always been at NBC as Jana has. I've always been at CBS. But uh, I really grew to respect not just Tom, but the, the entire Brokaw family. Um, you know, Tom's daughter is an emergency room physician in San Francisco. At least last I heard, she was. And I can only imagine the sacrifices that she has had to make over these many weeks uh, in the tradition of the Brokaw family. So um, I'd love to do a podcast with Tom. I, I, uh, I'm an enormous, enormous admirer. Well, we'll stay tuned. Um, this question comes from DB. With the pandemic, the U.S. seems to be struggling with unity more than other democratic countries are. How much of a role do you think the media plays in that? I often worry the media thinks it's reporting conventional wisdom when it's actually creating conventional wisdom. For example, the amount of coverage given to, quote, liberate us protests, though most Americans don't support them. Do you think he said, she said framing is negatively impacting pandemic unity? Interesting. Um, uh, have the protests around the country gotten too much coverage? Perhaps. When I'm covering something like that, and it, it, television almost always magnifies things, it makes almost everything look bigger uh, and grander than it actually is. 
So what I think you should do on events like that is step back 20 yards and take the picture. Um, that crowd might look really small if you, if you looked at it the way another person walking down the street might have seen it. And that's another way of putting things in perspective. Uh, I could not agree more that if you put Dr. Anthony Fauci in one screen and put the protesters in the other screen and created some kind of equivalence between the two, you're probably not telling the story right. Balance is important, but we also have to be very careful to make sure that if something is out of balance, that we report that too. That's part of the facts. Sometimes these days it feels like the classic Bart Simpson conundrum of you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, um, which is always, as Scott can attest, the way journal, if everybody's mad at you, well, that's, you probably hit the right note at some point. Yes. But he's absolutely right. There shouldn't be a false equivalency. I think I can, I can only speak for myself. The last four and a half to five years of my journalism career have been like no other just because social media can amplify voices and we aren't quite yet certain how many voices are in one space or another space and that's a, a space that we can go to physically and visually. And so we are only human inside of newsrooms as well. We're trying to dissect the voices we're hearing and, and what we're at, at a rapid pace, right? That we have more newscasts, social media, everything's breaking, moving all the time. And in the environment of division. And so while that is no excuse, we, we also have to be very diligent about what we put on our air. Um, and so I can assure you that those conversations happen every day, at least in the newsroom I work for, and I'm certain where Scott works. I mean, we have those kinds of conversations of what are we really looking at here? Like Scott just said, if you take a camera and get very close to three protesters and show that video, it seems urgent and yelling and shouting, and you can see the saliva come out of their mouth. But if you zoomed out across the street and found that it was only 25 people, well, that's a different picture of the same event. So we have to be always cognizant of that. If, if you show, you know, describe exactly what you're seeing. Don't take close-ups or, or just different things like that and never refer to the bigger picture. Um, I kind of have a question related to that. You both talked about the collaboration between your, your teams and how you're um, working with folks as you're the face of, but that you have this group that you're collaborating with. Um, how, how, what do those conversations look like in the newsroom when you're deciding how to present a story authentically? Uh, well, those conversations are uh, spirited, sometimes loud, uh, and uh, always quite vigorous. You, I think most people would be surprised, and I bet Jenna agrees with me, at how much uh, debate and difference of opinion there is in a newsroom and the enormous lengths we go to to verify facts and to make sure that uh, everything in our story is uh, what I like to call generally reliable. And I say that because we're human beings and of course we make mistakes. But uh, particularly at 60 Minutes, uh, we have these uh, screenings where we'll get the piece all put together the way we think it ought to be. And then we take it in and we screen it uh, for the boss, the executive producer and a jury of uh, senior producers from all walks of life, men and women, African-Americans, Hispanics, Asians. And um, sometimes we joke that the screenings turn into screamings because everybody starts yelling at one another about what should or should not be in the story. Uh, and then we get it all together and we get it down the middle of the road and we get it on the air on Sunday nights or anytime you like online these days. So um, I, th I think people would be very surprised because when you walk into a newsroom, in my experience, you walk into a pretty good representation of America. Men, women, blacks, whites, Hispanics, younger, older, etc. cetera. And uh, believe me, in newsrooms, those are places where ideas run free. 
it's completely true. I think what I miss, I mean, I'm sure every one of you listening right now that is that works outside the home, you may miss certain things about where you work. I miss the heartbeat of the newsroom and that heartbeat was spirited discussion. <laughs> Um, operating with everybody in different spaces right now, we have spirited discussion over Zoom, but that's not the same as the screaming. Um, so I think that, or I know that, uh, the public would be surprised. And we've talked about it before, you know, as we get accused or name called as something that is fake, we've discussed how can we be more transparent? It, how can we make this like seventh grade math where you have to show your work to prove that you didn't just go to the back of the work book and copy down the right answers? Uh, we toyed with putting cameras inside the newsroom, but then we were fairly certain that the FCC would take our license because it's not <laughs> wearing that happens. <laughs> I'm vetted at that point and we're not but it, it toughens your skin. You may not be your best self, but what's true about those spirited discussions is that people are not only standing up for why they believe this story needs to be this way, what they are standing up for the person who was interviewed or what they saw. They were in the field. They can tell us what happened. And they fight their executive producers or news directors to make that point that I was there. I bore witness to this. Here's the story. It's quite something to watch. Um, certainly humbles you, but we have long, long discussions about what gets, what gets on. To be a fly on the wall. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this is from Abby. How has your idea of truth changed since you first wanted to be a journalist? What a great question, Abby. You know, it, it as one becomes older and one becomes um, more educated in, in, because you're, you're constantly doing research for stories that you're working on, that's the great thing about journalism in my view. I, this is the world's greatest continuing education program. Uh, I spend all my days every day talking to the best experts in a particular field, whatever it may be, reading academic papers, going to see for myself. So all of that to say, you learn about the meaning of truth, I, I believe, over time. Um, some things that you believe were true, you come to realize were opinion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's very much like the scientific method that we've all learned about in high school, that there's a hypothesis, and then you look for evidence that either supports or knocks down the hypothesis. The important thing for the journalist, I believe, is to not care whether the hypothesis is supported or knocked down. You just go where the information, where the evidence takes you. And so I've learned that about truth as I've grown older in my career, per perhaps arguably wiser, although my wife would probably argue with that point, um, that, that truth is findable. Truth is real, but it takes an enormous amount of work to get there. Jana, did you have anything you want to add? No, I just hope that everyone that is listening to this or watching this heard a bit of what Scott just said that I think is so critical right now to every single person. It's not just for journalism students. It's not just for those of us working in journalism as truth seekers. Every person is consuming news and information. Every person is living a life in this democracy and so ingest your news with that mindset where you just want truth and facts and data and let that take you where it takes you don't decide that it can't take you somewhere it's so critical right now that we just get you the information and that i hope we come to a time where people take that truth and and use it in their own lives and, and whatever effect that has. But as we can, as people decide what the truth is before they take in the information, that's what's heartbreaking. And I think that's why right now, I mean, obviously we're talking about a truth worth telling 
And Scott so beautifully titled that book, A Truth Worth Telling is is one that we, I don't know how I want to say this, um, A Truth Worth Telling is one worth listening to. And I hope we all start to listen a little bit more. Here, here. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. Um, this has been a really um, bright spot in a very long um, time in our various homes um, away from other people. And this is such a great way to feel connected and to focus on um, the important parts of navigating this sort of new terrain that we're all worldwide faced with. Um, so to have two such um, wonderful leaders in that joining us at Wordplay today is amazing. Um, and I want to say thank you so much to St. Catharines University. This has been one of their critical conversations. They're a presenting sponsor of Wordplay along with the Star Tribune. Um, and if you would like to check out a few more Wordplay events, we have a couple more days left. You can find out about them on loftwordplay.org. Um, and please don't forget to click on this kind of turquoise link below and get yourself a copy of Scott's book, A Truth Worth Telling. Um, this It's absolutely essential reading, particularly now, but just in general. So I really encourage you all to do that. Um, Scott, mind holding it up for people can be inspired you have a copy on you you want to hold it up and we'll just remind people to grab that I happen to have found one there we yeah. go if you haven't seen it. <laughs> all right but, well thank you so much steph let me thank you and wordplay and saint Catharines and the loft and and jana in particular for a thoroughly enjoyable hour thank you so very much thank you